Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trulia, and today we are going to be doing a topic a little earlier than we scheduled of no salvation outside the church. This is a very controversial topic, and I think one that is not dealt with appropriate nuance. It's either dismissed or radically mispresented, uh, misrepresented in such a way, which really doesn't do justice to the doctrine. Uh, it is historic doctrine of the church. It's the plain reading of the actual scriptures on the topic. And so it's, to me, a pleasure to be able to discuss this in detail. We're going to be taking some time. So please take notes and have an open mind, not to something crazy, but to what the scriptures and saints teach. All right. And so today we are doing no salvation outside the church. The history of a doctrine, everything in between. Now let's establish some ground rules because I find whenever discussing this topic, these sort of odd things come up. And if we talk about this in the beginning, we could avoid some misconceptions. So number one, the Orthodox teaching is good works performed that side of faith in Christ are not salvific. And we have a Pan-Orthodox council Decree 14 of the Council of Jerusalem, 1672, that states this. And the reason why this is important is because people will say there's no salvation outside the church. Well, aren't there all sorts of good people throughout the world? Shouldn't God save them? And without even getting to, there's no one good but God alone, right? So how apart from theosis could we be good and be saved? Let's just take plainly what the actual uh, council says on this topic. So Decree 14 states, from which it is also apparent that the good which a man may do cannot truly be sin. For it is impossible for that what is good to be evil, although being done by nature only intended to form the natural character of the doer, but not the spiritual, it does not itself contribute to salvation without faith. Consequently, he is not able of himself to do any work worthy of a Christian life, although he has it in his own power to will or not to will to cooperate with grace. All right. And so long story short, by nature, man is good. By nature, man can do good things. That's according to the natural character of man. But it cannot contribute to salvation without faith because one cannot do anything worthy uh, any work worthy of a christian life without cooperating in the grace of god which requires faith and that's what eternity is is a co-energizing a co-willing god's will and god's works we're divinized by his energies we will and we work in a cooperation parallel with that of god and so that's why those apart from faith they cannot be saved and that's a basic thing it's really misunderstood it's not god being unfair the person who does not have faith does not will their own salvation. They don't even desire it. Because what is salvation? An eternity co-willing and cooperating with God. Now, number two, this should be basic interpretive skills. But I want to say this from the offset so people could understand how to read uh, these different texts that we're going to be going through in this presentation. The audience of a passage often explains its tone, right? So we need to understand who the saint is talking to and then use that to help interpret the passage. So we're going to have passages that are color coded in this and so that people can understand who it's being written to. So, for example, the, and if it's in red, the author's in red, this means it's written to Orthodox Catholic clergy or the very educated or monastics, not your average bear, right? People that are very well read on the topic, that will be in red. And that kind of pink color, that will be written to Orthodox Catholic laymen or a general Orthodox audience, meaning your average dude at liturgy, right? To average layman. Now in yellow or orange, you're gonna see is a passage that's written to schismatics or those outside the church, okay? So based on the color, you're going to see there's a certain consistency in the tone of some of these passages. And so what you don't want to do is take something that is, let's say, written to 
Orthodox Catholic laymen in a pastoral context. The idea is to make them focus on their own repentance, their own salvation, and then apply that as some sort of categorical theological rule when we actually have passages which are intended to be categorical theological rules, right? Written to, let's say, clergy or monastics, people that are not being taught the doctrine as a matter of personal orthopraxy, but are being taught the doctrine as a matter of who's in and who's outside salvation. So number three, we need to admit to ourselves a basic uh, presupposition and interpretation before encountering any of these passages, which is, do we believe that saints either contradict each other on the question, right? So then just some are wrong, some are right, right? If someone says they contradict, then you could just disregard any passage you don't like. Or do we out of piety believe that the saints fundamentally agree and are clarifying different aspects of the same doctrine? So are they disagreeing and that lets us be like Protestants and pick what we like? Or are the saints fundamentally agreeing but talking about different facets of the doctrine? All right, we have to seriously ask ourselves this. We have to ask ourselves, is harmonizing the saints on this question even credible? And I'll, I'm going to say that it is. And I think when we look at these passages, that's going to be uh, extremely obvious. Now, number four. Out-of-context quotations are unhelpful, okay? And we will and will be discussed in the beginning of this presentation. So it's not to distract from quotations that really weigh on this question. There is kicking around on the internet some really misleading quote minds on no salvation outside the church, which on purpose have the agenda of making look like that there is salvation outside the church. And so, of course, in order to teach something like that, that's so radically contrarian, so radically against the plain statements of the saints, they'll need to take quotations from other saints that are radically out of context. And that's what we're going to show. I'm going to show you the context behind these quotes that these contrarians use to say there is salvation outside the church. And you're going to see this is clearly not what those passages are about. And we'll do that in the beginning so that when you see that these people have no credibility in using these passages, that you'll be open-minded to what the saints really teach on this extremely important topic. Now, it's very important that we avoid extremes of interpretation when dealing with this topic. One must not read a quote too easily affirming that all sorts of people who are clearly are not saved, they're saved. All right, we got to avoid that extreme. So for example, there are people like, because it's just our natural human inclination um, or fallen human inclination, we don't want to believe that God really damns anyone. So people will try to take at passages and say, oh, this should, makes it seem like God doesn't do such a thing. But that's too extreme. Here's an example, Acts 17, 30 to 31. It states, Truly, the St. Paul in his preaching states, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, he says to the Athenian Gentiles, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man of whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him, that is Jesus Christ, from the dead. So it would be too extreme to say, well, God really did overlook all the sins of the Gentiles before St. Paul preached to the Athenians, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, right? That's obvious hyperbole. Now, what St. Paul is actually saying is that people are less accountable before they heard the gospel. They're less accountable, you know, before Christ came to this world and put the, you know, and put the death, death, right? But now God commands all men to repent. So now it's especially important, right? That's the obvious meaning of the passage. Not that God overlooked all the sins of the Gentiles before that point in time. That'd be too extreme. But there's extremes on the other side that we have to avoid. One must not read a quote too easily affirming that just because the passage says all X are damned, that it applies to every individual that is X at all times. That is also too extreme. So we see this in Revelation 21.8. It states, The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, 
sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So if we were to look at this in a very extreme way, we'd say all liars go to hell. So if you ever told a lie, you're going to hell. And if you're Christian and you ever told a lie, you're going to hell forever and ever and ever. And of course, that's not the case. It's those who are unrepentant that go to hell. Unrepentant liars, unrepentant unbelievers, unrepentant cowards, uh, unrepentant murderers, unrepentant uh, perverts, sorcerers, idolaters, etc. Right? So it would be too extreme to see something that says all X is damned, and that means they all categorically are without any nuance. Obviously, this is important when we read a saint that says there's no salvation outside the church. People hear that, and for some reason, they'll interpret Revelation 21.8 knowing, well, it's too extreme to make it categorical, but they'll read the saint saying there's no salvation outside the church. So they'll hear someone like me say there's no salvation outside the church, and then they will just say, well, that's got to be wrong. Instead of saying, no, the way you're hearing it is too extreme. You have to... You have to interpret this in a normal manner as we would interpret the scriptures, for example, like we just covered here. So we have to avoid extremes. Now, let me start with a summary because it helps people remember better. So I'm going to give you the end, then go through everything, and then give you the whole end again. So my summary. We know where salvation is, but not where it isn't is definitionally incorrect. Let me repeat, those who say we know where salvation is, but not where it isn't, is definitionally incorrect. Those who say, oh, I know where salvation is, but I don't know if, you know, if the, this Protestant church or wherever, the Roman Catholics, no, there is no salvation outside the church. So by definition, we do know where there's no salvation. There is no salvation outside the church, period. And there is salvation in the church. We know where damnation isn't, right? It's not in the church and where it is. Why do I say that? Because obviously we avoid extremes. So just because damnation isn't in the Orthodox Church, that doesn't mean every single Orthodox Christian is saved. That's obviously not true. And just because there's salvation not in the church, that doesn't mean there isn't salvation outside the church. That does not mean every individual outside the church will end up being damned because we have to avoid those interpretive extremes, all right? Now, someone said, all right, well, you're making this so subjective and postmodernist per se, though I, I'm not, I'm gonna be teaching what the saints teach. Just give me the nitty gritty, what's the deal? All right, here's the deal. Let me put in real simple language for the year 2022. Normally, 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 that's a word from uh, Seraphim, uh, rows of blessed memory normally one can only be saved in the orthodox church so if you want to kind of cut around all these interpretive difficulties let me just put it to you real straight normally one can only be saved in, in the orthodox church yet not everyone in the orthodox church is saved and not everyone outside the church is damned as said before exceptions because what is normal is salvation within the orthodox church are not the rule but we so meaning just because we have someone like Trajan, who is uh, outside the church, and Saint Gregory the Great traditionally prayed him to go uh, for him to go to heaven, and he went to heaven. We can't expect that means everyone outside the church thereby saved because Trajan was, right? Exceptions are not the rule. The rule is the rule. That's something that should be fairly obvious. All right. So now let's talk about some irrelevant quotes on popular quote minds in Wikipedia. I will talk about the relevant ones and how they weigh on this question, but sadly, a lot of people use irrelevant quotes. Those who espouse that there's salvation outside the church against the saints often misrepresent texts and post them onto Wikipedia and quote minds. And I will tell you this, you shall know them by their fruits. If they're going to misrepresent these texts, why would you trust their conclusion that there's salvation outside the church? If they're fundamentally dishonest with how they try to prove that conclusion to you, why would that conclusion be correct? So as follows is not a categorical list. I will not include uh, quotes that they use that don't weigh on the question whatsoever, because sometimes they, they pick quotes and it has nothing to do with whether salvation outside the church or not. So I'm not even going to bother with those. 
but only those that appear to. Okay, so let's now cover uh, those quotes. There's one from a quote mine from Justin Martyr, Dialogue with Trifle. Now I'm going to read what you'll see on Wikipedia in this quote mine, okay, with all the ellipses and stuff. So you can see how misleading what they present to you is. Each one shall be saved by his own righteousness. Those who regulate their lives by the law of Moses will in like manner be saved. So it sounds like all good people are saved. Since those who did that which is universally, naturally, eternally good are pleasing to God, they shall be saved through this Christ in the resurrection, equally those righteous men who were before them, namely Noah and Enoch and Jacob, and whoever else there be, along with those who have known this Christ. So obviously the person, the quote mine, is quoting this from Justin Martyr to make it seem like what Decree 14 of the Council of Jerusalem taught is wrong, right? But now let's go to the actual quote. Chapter 45, A Dialogue with Trifo. Here's how it begins, because I'm going to give you the full context. Trifo says, Tell me then, shall those who lived according to the law given by Moses live in the same matter with Jacob, Enoch, Noah, and the resurrection of the dead, or not? So he's talking about, are Jews saved? <laughs> right? That's the question. Trifo's a Jew. He's asking Justin, well, aren't the Jews of the past saved? And how does Justin respond? When I quoted, sir, the word spoken by Ezekiel, that even if Noah and Daniel and Jacob were to beg sons and daughters, this request would not be granted them, but that each one, that is to say, shall be saved by his own righteousness. I said also that those who regulated their lives by the law of Moses would in like manner be saved. For what in the law of Moses is naturally good and pious and righteous and has been prescribed to be done by those who obey it. And what has appointed to be performed by reason of the hardness of people's hearts was similarly recorded and done also by those who were under the law. So he's speaking of Jews, right? Those who are under the law, that's who he's speaking of, the salvation of Jews. Justin continues, Since those who did that which is universally, naturally, eternally good are pleasing to God, they shall be saved through this Christ in the resurrection, equally with those righteous men who are before them, namely Noah, Enoch, and Jacob. So now we see the whole reference to that. And whoever else there be, along with those who have known this Christ, meaning faithful Jews before Christ and Christians after Christ are saved. Son of God, who is before the morning star and the moon and submitted to become incarnate and be born of this virgin of the family of David in order that by this dispensation, the serpent that sinned from the beginning and the angels like it may be destroyed and that death may be condemned and forever quit at the second coming of Christ himself, those who believe in him and live acceptably, right? Like the Jews who lived acceptably, and be no more. When some are sent to be punished unceasingly into judgment and condemnation of fire, but others shall exist in freedom from suffering and from corruption and from grief and immortality. So with the full um, context, chapter 45 is in reference to Jews before the time of Christ. It is stated that those who lived under the law previously had implicit faith in Christ. Right? So look at this. Trifone, chapter 46, says, But if some even now wish to live in the observance the institutions given by Moses, and yet believe in this Jesus who was crucified, recognize him to be the Christ of God, and that it is given to him to be absolute judge of all, and that his is the everlasting kingdom, can they also be saved? So you see, he says, well, how about Jews now that live according to the law and they believe in Jesus Christ? Could Jewish Christians be saved? Justin responds, You perceive that God by Moses laid all such ordinances upon you on account of the harness of your people's hearts, in order that by the large number of them you might keep God continually and in every action before your eyes and never begin to act unjustly or impiously. But we, because we refuse to sacrifice to those whom we were of old accustomed to sacrifice, undergo extreme penalties and rejoice in death. Believing that God will raise up by his Christ and will make us incorruptible, undisturbed, and immortal. And we know that the ordinances opposed by the reason, reason of the harness of your people's hearts contribute nothing to the performance of righteousness and of piety. All right. So we could see Justin's response is, you don't have to follow the law anymore. Christians are saved, but we don't follow the Jewish law. And that's his response. So nowhere in these passages is this idea that people are saved by virtue of being good. Nowhere in these passages is the idea that Jews are saved. The answer given is those who have faith in Christ are saved. That's Justin Martyr's basic answer. That's pretty much the point of this passage, right? So the whole way it's quoted in the quote mine against still salvation outside the church is terribly misleading. Now let's look at another quote mine and it's misleading character. 
The first apology Justin Martyrs quoted in the quote mine, but no, they don't even give a chapter, so you can't even look up context. What's the quote mine saying? The quote mine says this, Christ is the Logos of whom the whole race of men partake. Those who lived according to the Logos are Christians, even if they were considered atheists, such as among the Greeks, Socrates and Her Heraclitus. So what's the person led to believe? That Greek philosophers are saved. They're, you know, uh, they're saved because they're Christians by virtue of living according to the Logos. And so that must mean people that aren't Christians that live according to the Logos somehow, they're saved. Well, is this what Justin Martyr is saying? Well, let's look at the passage. It's chapter 46 in the first apology. And I just want you guys to know, this is obviously written to those outside the church. So that's the context of this passage, right? His first apology is a defense to informed pagans. What's Justin Martyr say? We have been taught that Christ is the firstborn of God, and we have declared above that he is the word of whom every race of men were partakers. And those who lived reasonably are Christians, even though they have been thought atheist, as among the Greeks, Socrates, and Heraclitus, and men like them, and among the barbarians, Abraham, and Ananias, and Zarias, and Mishael, and Elias, and many others whose actions and names we now decline to recount, because we know it would be tedious, so that even they who lived before Christ and lived without reason were wicked and hostile to Christ, and slew those who lived reasonably, i.e., those who live reasonably, the implicit Christians. And we, since the proof of this subject is less needful now, will pass for the present to the proof of those things which are urgent. Now, I'm going to tell you this before giving you more context. His point is that the Greek philosophers knew the Jewish law and thereby were really proto-Christians. Not that... going to share screen again and worse comes to worse we'll just do the show again i might try to edit this part out but that being said i am back and we're going to go back to the point we were making so the point that was being made is that we see the context in chapter 46 that those who were thought to be atheists these greek philosophers they're not saved because they're good people or because they're smart they're saved because plato borrowed from god he borrowed from moses Right? Plato borrowed a statement that God, having altered matter, which was shapeless, made the world. Here are the very words spoken through Moses, who as above shown was the first prophet and of greater antiquity than the Greek writers. So that both Plato and they who agree with him and we ourselves have learned, and you also be convinced, that by the word of God, the whole world was made of the substance spoken of before by Moses. Right? Moses wrote first. Plato got it from Moses. So the argument is they were thought to be atheists, but they weren't. They were crypto-Jews. That is Justin Martyr's point, right? So you're saved, according to him, by being faithful. And before Christ came, they had this implicit faith in Christ because they were faithful Jews. So that is Justin Martyr's point. Now look at him continuing with chapter 60. And the physiological discussion concerning the Son of God in the Timaeus of Plato, where he says he placed him crosswise in the universe, he borrowed in like manner from Moses, right? Plato's getting this from the, the Jewish writers. And when this was done, it is recorded that the serpents died and is handed down that the people thus escaped death, which things Plato reading and not accurately understanding and not apprehending that it was the figure of the cross. But taken to be a placing crosswise, he said the power next to the first God was placed crosswise in the universe. Right? So again, Plato's a crypto Jew. He just didn't fully get it because he didn't have the gospel preached to him. So... 
we now have dispensed with one of these passages that's been radically misused by the quote minds. Let's deal with another. Irenaeus against Heresies, book four and various chapters, which of course the quote mind doesn't tell you the chapters in a correct way. Um, but here's what it says. It says, there is one in the same God, the father and his logos, always assisting the human race with varied arrangements. To be sure in doing many things and saving from the beginning those who are saved, for they are those who love and those who, to, according to their generation, following his logos. For the Son administering all things for the Father completes his work from the beginning to the end. For the Son assisting to his own creation from the beginning reveals the Father to all of whom he wills. So again, the quote might trying to lead you to believe that God always assisting the whole human race has always been saving people um, according to the logos. And it's left in this vague way with these ellipses. So that way you're led to believe that in some sort of like kind of universalism, that God's just always been saving all men. But what does St. Irenaeus really say? Book four, chapter seven. As Paul does also testify saying, we are children of Abraham because of the similarity of our faith and the promise of inheritance. He is therefore one in the same God who called Abraham and gave him the promise, but he is the creator of who does also through Christ prepare lights in the world, namely those who believe from among the Gentiles. He's, and he says, you are the light of the world that is as the stars of heaven. Him therefore I have rightly shown to be known by no man unless by the Son, whoever the Son shall reveal him. It continues, but the Son reveals the Father to whom all he wills that he should be known. And neither without the goodwill of the Father nor without the agency of the Son can any man know God. Wherefore did the Lord say to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would, you would have known my Father also. And from henceforth you have known, you have been both known by him and seen, have seen him. From these words it is evident that he is known by the Son, that is the word. Therefore have the Jews departed from God and not receiving his word. So the whole point of the passage is that those who had faith in Christ, those who had faith, among the Jews are saved. It has nothing to do with all of humanity. It's about the Jews, right? That's what it says in chapter seven. So let's look at this other way the quote minds mishandle Irenaeus. They quote him as follows. They give variable citations that don't agree on the chapter. Christ came not only for those who believed from the time of Tiberius Caesar, nor did the Father provide only for those who are now but for absolutely all men from the beginning who according to their ability feared and loved God and lived justly and desired to see Christ and hear his voice, right? So the idea is all men that vaguely want this, you know, hear Christ and have faith in him are saved. Now, I'm even somewhat open to that, but that's not Irenaeus's point. What's he actually say? It's quoted in chapter 22 and 23 of book four of Against Heresies. He says, for it was not merely for those who believed on him in the time of Tiberius Caesar that Christ came, nor did the Father exercise his providence for the men only who are now alive, but for all men together, who from the beginning, according to their capacity in their generation, have both feared and loved God and practiced justice and piety towards their neighbors and have earnestly desired to see Christ and hear his voice. Wherefore, he shall at his second coming first rouse from their sleep all persons of this description and shall raise them up as well as the rest of all, a rest who shall be judged and give them a place in his kingdom. For truly one God had directed the patriarchs towards his dispensation and has justified the circumcision, circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. So all Irenaeus is saying, God saves the faithful Jews and he saves us among the Gentiles who believe now who are alive, right? It has nothing to do with what uh, those who say no salvation outside the church are saying. It has everything to do with just plainly faithful Jews are saved and faithful Christians are saved now that Christ came to the world. And like St. Justin Martyr, of course, you can't just stay a Jew. Now you have to be a Christian. He continues. So to show I'm not telling you this stuff out of context. For as in the rest we were prefigured, so on the other hand, are they, are they represented in us, that is, in the church, and receive the recompense for those things which they accomplish? For which reason the Lord declared to the disciples, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look upon the districts, for they are white to harvest. For the harvest man receives his wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal. 
that both that he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. For in this is the saying true, that one sows and another reaps. For I have sent you forward to reap, that whereon you bestow no labor. Other men have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Who then are they that have labored and have helped forward the dispensations of God? It is clear that they are the patriarchs and prophets who even prefigured our faith. Again, nothing I'm saying is out of context. You get the context of Irenaeus, it's very clear. Those patriarchs and prophets who prophesied the coming of Christ prefigured the faith of Jesus Christ. That's why they're saved. So that's all the passage is about. It has nothing to do with universal salvation, people that don't have faith in Christ being saved um, just by their good works. It has nothing to do with that. Now, guys, I know I'm going through it quick. I'm, we're barely started and we're 30 minutes in. You may have to watch this again, slow it down. I will put the PowerPoint up when I'm done. So let us continue. St. Gregory Nazianzus in Oration 18, of course, without any paragraph or anything, he's quoted as follows in this misleading way. It says, he, he speaks of his own uh, father, if I remember right, was ours even before he was of our fold. His manner of life made him one of us. Just as there are many of our own who are not with us, whose lives alienate them from the common body, so too there are many of those outside who belong really to us, men whose devout conduct anticipates their faith. They lack only the name of that which, is, which in fact they possess. My father was one of these, an alien shoot, but inclined to us in his manner of life. So the quote minds are trying to say, oh, St. Gregory Nazianzus is, is seriously teaching his father was saved, um, before he was a Christian. All right. Now let's look at this oration in paragraphs five to six so we can understand in context what St. Gregory Nazianzus' point, because he's not actually commenting on salvation outside the church. He says as follows about his father. Because this glory is common to him with many others, and all must come into the great net of God and be caught by the words of the fishers, although some are earlier, some later, and closed by the gospel. Right? He's saying all must be accept the teaching of the gospel. But what does especially in his life uh, but what does especially in his life move my wonder, his father, it is needful for me to mention, even before he was of our fault, he was ours. His character made him one of us. For as many of our own are not with us who whose life alienates them from the common body, so many of those without are on our side, whose character anticipates their faith and need only the name of that which indeed they possess. My father was one of these, an alien shoot, but inclined by his life toward us. He was so far advanced in self-control that he became at once most beloved and most modest, two qualities difficult to combine. And so what's the point of the passage is there's those you think that aren't saved, but they're going to accept the gospel and be saved. They've been predestined essentially to salvation, right? He's saying his father is one of these, that he had a life befitting of a Christian, and so it was necessary for him to be caught up by the net of the gospel. So that's why I don't even put a color coding on this, because it's not about salvation outside the church. It's about preaching the gospel to those, especially those if only they knew the gospel will accept it. Their manner of life is just so similar. And so... In a sense, that's why there's Orthodox, there's Protestants, there's Roman Catholics whose hearts aren't set against the Orthodox Church. And so I tell them of the Orthodox Church in the hope that they'll become Orthodox because their manner already is Orthodox. So it's in that way in which he's discussing this issue. Um, for those who are curious, St. Gregory Nazianzus' father was like this kind of monotheistic sect, but that wasn't really Christian. And so he was very close to Christianity. It's compared to like pagans and multiple gods. Um, and he apparently was quite pious and virtuous. And so it was fitting that he'd be caught up by the preaching of the gospel. Now, I'm going to purposely get into, at this point, quotes of, I'm going to prove to you, there's no salvation outside the church. So here, we're 34 minutes in. Now we're getting started. I'm going to give relevant quotes, not, in popular quote minds of Wikipedia. All quotes are context approved, they're context certified. I've read the context of these quotes and I'm not quoting them out of context and I challenge anyone to do a response show and show these quotes are out of context because they are not. 
I'm also purposely not going to include quotes you've seen in popular quote minds because I want to do something new. I want to show there's more to it than what people have already seen and are used to. So I'm not going to include some of the obvious ones, like Ignatius, who says anyone who follows those who go into schism are you know, not going to hurt the kingdom of God. Not going to quote it. I'm not going to quote St. Irenaeus, who said, She, the church, is the entrance to life, and all others are thieves or robbers. On this account, we are bound to avoid them. Right? I'm not going to quote St. Irenaeus on that, because other quote minds have it. I'm not going to quote anything from St. Cyprian, because everyone ignores him. He's just too clear on this issue. He coined the term, no salvation outside the church. So why even bother quoting him? Because no one even says he's quoted out of context. They just say he's wrong. So I'm not even going to bother quoting him. I'm going to show he's not the only one who said it. I'm not going to bother quoting St. Jerome, who said, he who is, who is not found in the church shall perish. Not even going to bother, because people have seen that a thousand times. I'm not going to bother quoting St. Augustine, who said, no man can find salvation except in the Catholic Church. Outside the Catholic Church, one can have everything except salvation. I'm not even going to bother quoting St. Augustine. There's a thousand quote minds with that passage. So I'm not even going to bother quoting him. I'm not going to bother quoting St. Fulgentius of Rups of Rusp. Because quote minds contain this doozy. Not only pagans, but also all Jews, all heretics, and all schismatics who finish this life outside of the Catholic Church will go into the eternal fire. Now, I'm not avoiding quoting these because they're out of context. I've read the context behind all this, including uh, uh, Fulgentius, because you could translate the Latin pretty easily. These are all in context, but I'm not going to bother quoting them because they're too obvious but because people have become used to ignoring them. So I'm purposely going to include quotes that you have not seen before. So that way you'll see, yes, this is a consensus doctrine of the church. It's not just like these six, seven quotes I quoted. There's tons. So let's get into them. Start to the Bible. You see pink there. Pink means that this is a passage written for lay people. What does St. Paul write? St. Paul writes in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, literally means sex in the Greek, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Though so those who are in sex will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is such a clear passage that there's no salvation outside the church. That's literally what he's stating. That those in sex who practice sectarianism will not inherit the kingdom of God. He writes this to the lay people because he wants them these Galatians are being bewitched by these uh, Ju Judaizers. He wants them not to go down into the road of schism. Okay? Now we got another passage. One that's some reason never quoted, but very clear. It's written to schismatics. First Clement 41. This is literally the earliest passage in church history addressing schismatics. What does he say? St. Clement writes, that in chapter 41, let every one of you brethren, and he's speaking of the self-ordained leaders of the Corinthian schism, he calls them brethren, give thanks to God in his own order, living in all good conscience with becoming gravity and not going beyond the rule of the ministry prescribed to him. Those therefore who do anything beyond that which is agreeable to his will are punished with death. All right, so note, these schismatics are not charged with any non-ecclesiastical doctrinal heresy. They're not teaching that Christ is in God. They're not Judaizers. They're not teaching any heresy. He's saying they are punished with death just for schism. Just for schism. Let's get some more context from 1 Clement, chapters 56 to 57. He writes, Let us then also pray for those who have fallen into any sin, that meekness and humility may be given to them, so they may submit not unto us, but to the will of God. For in this way they shall secure a fruitful and perfect remembrance from us with sympathy for them, both in our prayers to God and our mention of them to the saints. Meaning, he, will, he won't excommunicate them anymore. He'll eucharistically commemorate them. You, therefore, who have laid the foundation of this sedition, the schism, submit yourselves to the presbyters and receive correction so as to repent, bending the knees of your hearts, 
Learn to be subject, laying aside the proud and arrogant self-confidence of your tongue. Right? So what he said before that they should fear death, he says that they must repent of their sedition. So there's no, no doubt as to what sin he's saying they must repent of. It's of schism. So let's continue with chapters 58 and 59. Let us therefore flee from the warning threats pronounced by wisdom on the disobedient and yield submission to his all and holy glorious name. That we may stay our trust upon the most hallowed name of his majesty, receive our counsel, and ye shall be without repentance. If, however, any shall disobey the word spoken by him through us, let them know that they will involve themselves in transgression and serious danger, right? What was that danger in chapter 41? Death. He's not talking about death penalty. He's talking about damnation. All right. And so when speaking to those outside the church, how does St. Clement speak to schismatics? He says, it's seriously dangerous. Not, oh, we know where salvation is, not where it is. And you could feel okay. That's absolutely not the tone he takes. Now, here's a quote from St. Ignatius that you don't see in the popular quote minds. All right. This is, you see, in red, which means it's written to Polycarp, an Orthodox clergyman. So he shoots pretty straight with Polycarp. What's he say? If anyone can continue in a state of purity to the honor of him who is Lord of the flesh, let him so remain without boasting. If he begins to boast, he is undone. And if he reckon himself greater than the bishop, this means in no need of a bishop, he is ruined. But it becomes both men and women who marry to form their union with the approval of the bishop, that their marriage may be according to God and not after their own lust. So if we know from St. Ignatius, he says, where the bishop is and where the Eucharist is, there is the Catholic Church. If you are apart from the bishop, right, you're not in the church. So he who reckons himself greater than the bishop is ruined. Now I posit to you, this is a euphemism for saying that in no need of a bishop, getting married without a bishop, being ascetic without a bishop, right? Just being holy and pious, like a Protestant outside of uh the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church. Now, some would say this is an odd proof text, but I want to read for you the Syriac paraphrase because it's going to show you how someone in the second century, which is when the Syriac is dated, understood the passage. What does the Syriac version of Polycarp chapter 5 say? It says as follows. If any man is able in power to continue in purity to honor of the flesh of our Lord, let him continue so without boasting. If he boasts, he is undone. If he become known apart from the bishop, he has destroyed himself. And it's becoming, therefore, to men and women who marry, that they marry with the counsel of the bishop, that the marriage may be in our Lord and not in lust. So both the celibate and the married need to be attached to the bishop. That, that is what he says, is that they may marry with the counsel of the bishop. Those who are known apart from the bishop, meaning known for not having a bishop, they destroy themselves. This is a very serious passage. Again, not in quote minds, because it requires a little bit of thinking, but it shows you in a very early source like St. Clement, this idea that there's no salvation outside the church was well understood. These were disciples of the apostles, by the way. How about St. Irenaeus, who's a disciple of Polygarp? Here is a quote you don't see, but I am fond of quoting. Book four, chapter 33, paragraph seven. St. Irenaeus says, he shall also judge those who give rise to schisms who are destitute of the love of God and who look to their own special advantage rather than to the unity of the church and who for trifling reasons or any kind of reason which occurs to them cut in pieces and divide the great and glorious body of Christ. For no reformation of so great importance can be effected by them as will compensate for the mischief arising from their schism. So we have here a passage where Sirenaria says there could be no reason, no matter how good, to go into schism. God will judge those who are des and he says that are destitute of the love of God, right? Those, if I have faith that can move mountains and have not love, I have nothing, as uh, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. Those who give rise to schisms are destitute of the love of God. And no reason, no matter how bad things were, you know, Luther had to do it, no, no, nothing, no matter how bad something is, nothing could compensate for mischief as schism. And so it's a very clear passage that people don't want to accept, but 
they make excuses. Because again, like Satan told even the garden, did God really say? God knows that you'd be like him. That's why he doesn't want you to do it. People make excuses for rules and for teachings they don't want to accept. Their itching ears want a teacher telling them, oh, the schismatics were way more heretical back then than now. He wouldn't say that about us lovey-dovey Protestants. We're great. Us lovey-dovey Roman Catholics, we're great. Well, that's just not true. Let's take St. Fermilion, who's quoted by in Cyprian Epistle 7415. It's actually a whole letter from St. Fermilion. This is written in the midst of the Novation Schism. The Novations were visually no different than the rest of the church. In fact, they didn't even need to be rebaptized or uh, re or reordained as clergy. That's that's how similar they were. They weren't heretical, really, like in any major doctrine. They were just too rigorous. They're too disciplined. Um, they were schismatics from a disputed papal election. So what's he say about these people that are just like Orthodox Christians? Are they saved? No, they're not. The Ark of Noah was nothing else than the sacrament of the Church of Christ, which then, when all without were perishing, kept those only safe who were within the Ark. We are manifestly instructed to look to the unity of the Church. Whoever are not in the Church with Christ will perish outside, unless they are converted by penitence to the only and saving lava, the baptism of the Church. So we have a very clear passage that no one is saved outside the church and they must be baptized in the church. That's what St. Vermilion is saying. And just so you know, it is in red because he's writing to a clergyman. He's writing to uh, St. Cyprian and the uh, African Synod. Now we got a passage from St. Augustine that you don't see in the quote lines. I have it in that yellow orange and it's written to schismatics, right? What? How does St. Augustine write the schismatics? Let's see. But I have the sacrament, you will say, Donatist, because he's writing the Donatist schismatics. You say the truth. The sacrament is divine. You have baptism, and that I confess. But what says the apostle? Faith is mighty, but without charity it profits nothing. Right? He quotes 1 Corinthians 13. The devils confess Christ. You have been baptized without. Have fruit, and you return to the ark. But do you say, why do you seek to us, if seek us as if we're bad men, that you that you may be good. The reason why we seek you is you are bad, right? Because they're outside the church, so they're by default sinful. They don't have the love of God. Consequently, we are seeking you. Return ye to the ark. But I have baptism already, say the Donatists. Though I should know all mysteries and have prophecy and all faith so as to move mountains, but have not charity, I am nothing. So now said Augustine, right to the Donatist, who like the Novatians, looked just like and believed things just like the Orthodox Christians, says, without charity, they're nothing. They're going to be damned. That's the context of these comments that St. Augustine has. Here's another one. St. Augustine, on baptism against the Donatist, book one, paragraph three, he's writing this to the Donatist. If anyone were compelled by urgent necessity, being unable to find a Catholic from which to receive baptism, and so... Look what he says. While preserving Catholic peace in his heart should receive from one without the pale of Catholic unity, the sacrament which he was attending received within its pale, this man should immediately depart this life we deem to be none other than a Catholic. I'm going to explain in a second, but he's saying those who desire to be Catholics or Orthodox, but they're going to die and allow themselves to be baptized by Donatists, he deems as Catholics. Let's continue. But if he should be delivered from the death of the body on his restoring himself in bodily presence to that Catholic congregation from which in heart he had never departed, so in faith, you know, in their hearts, they're faithful Orthodox, faithful Catholics, so far from blaming his conduct, we should praise it with that, the greatest truth and confidence. So let me translate this into English. Those intentionally baptized among the schismatics are condemned. But those who desire Orthodox unity but are baptized out of piousness, like, um, what's his name? Uh, there was a guy that St. Ambrose talked about, Saturinus, who baptized himself. We have that, uh, there's, and uh, Thecla baptized herself, if I remember right. There's those who just like do, it's a pious thing among the saints, where they're cut off from baptism. They baptize, they get baptized somehow. All St. Augustine says, as long as a person who does it, desires to be Catholic, really wants to be Orthodox. They wouldn't go among the schismatics unless they had no choice. They are saved. 
So this passage to me shows pretty clearly he's saying Baptist, it's not like Donatists are saved. It's those who are lost among the Donatists, but you know, they're geographically cut off, but want to be Orthodox. If they submit to baptism because they're simply trying to have a sacrament, they will be saved because they are Orthodox in heart. So you can't be your heart set against the church. And we're going to see this with Sarah from Rose. You can't have your heart set against the church and be saved because, right, that lack of charity, you have nothing. You get a faith to move mountains, but you have love, you have nothing. So that's St. Augustine applying that. Another passage, this was um, written to a Catholic ruler. So that's why I put in red. This is not a dummy. This is someone who had to know the faith because he was a Roman ruler who was being, uh, had to make decisions over questions of religion. This is a passage that, um, thanks to uh, Father Peter Hears, um, that I was able to look into. And to me, it makes very clear that St. Augustine teaches that there's no salvation outside the church. Let's read the passage, because people will see what we saw before and go, huh, well, does that mean that baptism outside the church is salvific? Not according to St. Augustine. He says, they are yet in the body, but they cannot seek the Holy Spirit except in the body of Christ, the Donatists, that is, of which they possess the outward sign according to the uh, outward sign outside the church, but they do not possess the actual reality within the church of which that is the outward sign. And therefore they eat and drink damnation to themselves. So they have bread and wine, but it's only outwardly the flesh and blood of Christ. It only outwardly looks like the Eucharist. It's not. For there is but one bread, which is the sacrament of unity, seeing that as the apostle says, we being many are one bread and one body. Furthermore, the Catholic church alone is the body of Christ of which he is the head and savior of his body. Outside this body, the Holy Spirit gives life to no one. Seeing that as the apostle himself, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. But he is not a partaker of the divine love, who is the enemy of unity. Therefore, they have not the Holy Ghost who are outside the church. How clear is this? Anyone who claims Augustine taught their salvation outside the church, does not understand Augustine. These are obvious passages. If anyone, therefore, wishes to receive the Holy Spirit, let him beware of continuing alienation from the church. So we can see it goes beyond saying there's no salvation outside the church. It affirms only the form of sacraments outside the church. Like St. Nicodemus the Higgyrite says, the form exists, but you need uh, the grace that's only in the church. That's why uh, those who have baptisms accepted in the Orthodox Church still need to be chrismated. But salvation, the actual reality, the Holy Spirit, but the quote Augustine, the actual reality itself is that sacramental grace is only in the church. So there means such a clear passage that salvation is only in the church. This is not something just out of context um, from St. Cyprian. This is all over the place. St. Gregory the Great, Morali on Job, both 35, 12 to 13. Gregory says, heretics, doubtless, when they come back from their error, cannot appease the wrath of God towards them by a sacrifice offered by themselves, unless they are converted to the Catholic Church. Right? So he says, the, uh, these heretics, they must be converted to the Catholic Church to be saved. For it is she alone through whom God willingly accepts a sacrifice. She alone who intercedes with confidence for those those who are in error. It is she alone who guards those who are placed within her by the strong bond of charity, right? We see that 1 Corinthians 13 standard again. Whence also the water of the deluge raised the ark indeed aloft, but destroyed all those whom it found out of the ark. It is she alone, that is the Catholic Church, in whom we truly contemplate the heavenly mysteries. So we see the exact same interpretation of the of Noah's Ark that St. Fermilion gave, that St. Cyprian gave, by given by St. Gregory the Great, also given by St. Augustine, by the way. No salvation outside the church. That, that's what he's saying. St. Bede on Genesis, talking about Noah's Ark. I read this in the actual translation. That's why you have the page number there, 173. And just as after the Ark was made, all those creatures that were saved were brought into it, the flood came and our and carried off all those that were outside of it. 
So when all people have been predestined for eternal life have entered the church, the end of the world will come, and all the people found outside the church will perish. And in this sense, the ark clearly signifies the church. Now it signifies the Lord that builds the church and his saints, and the flood signifies the end of the world or the last judgment. So again, we see the exact same interpretation of Noah's Ark given by Gregory, by Augustine, by Firmilian, by Cyprian. No salvation inside the church. By the way, St. Jerome gives the same exact interpretation of the Ark. Oh, you know, you're, you got a bunch of, you know, rigid Western thinkers. Gregory is Western. Bede is Western, though he wrote in Greek. Um, Augustine is Western. Um, Firmilian wrote to Cyprian, who's in the West, even though Firmilian is an Eastern bishop. Well, how about St. Gregory Palamas? You never see this in the quote minds. Homily 57, 9, page 471 in Veneman's translation. Here is mine. All right. So you can see that this is in Veneman's translation of St. Gregory Palmas. What's he teach? The same doctrine all the saints teach. Noah was shown to be the savior, not of all the race of men in general, but of his own household, all of whom were saved through him, in the same way Christ, too, is the savior of the race of men, not of all men in general, but of his own household, that is, of the church, not, however, of the disobedient. So, again, St. Gregory Palmas gave the same interpretation that we see in all the saints, West and East, on this question. This is not a weird Western thing from Cyprian and Augustine. This is the universal consensus teaching of the Orthodox Church. We got the Council of Jerusalem and just, I forgot the colors. The red St. Bede on Genesis is writing to educated monastics. St. Gregory the Great, Moralia Job, uh, writing to educated monastics. But now we see St. Gregory Palmas. What's that pink color? Let me remind you guys. He was writing to lay people. His homilies of their monastics were, there. that's why they're very easy to consume. They were written for the people in the cathedral in uh, Thessalonica. So he's saying this to everyone. This is something you should know. Now, the Council of Jerusalem gives a teaching, which lay people aren't supposed to be reading these councils, really. Um, that's more of a modern thing because I'm literate and I'm educated. You wouldn't have average laity reading these things. But the Council of Jerusalem teaches there's no salvation outside the church. So we actually have a pan-Orthodox council teach on this issue. It is settled. It's not only this consensus of the saints, but it's settled by a pan-Orthodox council. It was accepted by the remaining Pentarchy in Constantinople in 1718 and 1723. The Russian church received this council when they were sent it in 1723, and their synod issued a translation of it in 1838. And just so you know, this is not something that's like a blast of the past. In Crete 2016, right, the most recent biggest council the Orthodox Church had, it's accepted as a binding council, and 10 out of 14 jurisdictions accepted that council. So sorry, guys. Council of Jerusalem, this isn't like, oh, the church never accepted this. The church has always accepted this council. Up until 2016, it's still accepted. No one, is, no one has rejected this council. That's an online meme that has to die because people don't like what it teaches. But the Orthodox Church has received this council. It's dogmatic. It is binding. All right. What's the council say? I'm going to quote two parts. Decree 10. The dignity of the bishop is so necessary in the church that without him, Neither church nor Christian could either be could not either be or be spoken of. Right? So sorry, Baptists, you're not even Christians. Um, sorry, Presbyterians, you're not even Christians. Of course they're not saved. Oh, well, that's out of context. Well, let's uh let's read this in context. Page 25 in the open source translation of this council. We have uh the council writing in response to Cairo Lucaris's the one alleged to be from him, his uh, confession, his Calvinist confession. And so it writes in response to, we believe the authority of the Holy Scripture to be above the authority of the church. How do they respond to that proposition, that the Scripture is above the authority of the church? They respond, there's no salvation outside the church. Look, as none can sail across the sea without a boat, so thou canst not steer through this world and its billows and escape them without a boat, which is the church of Christ. Many endeavor to sail across it, the sea. Such are the impious and all heretics who are not within the church of God, but they are all drowned. 
When God made the ark, all that were within escaped, while those that were without perished. The church of God is this ark. How clear is that? They respond to the prophets and say the scripture is above the church, and they say, no, those the church, those outside of it aren't even saved. Now, just so you know, it's actually quoting Kyle Lucaris against himself and with the purpose of saying Kyle Lucaris didn't really write the scripture to be above the authority of church because he actually wrote that the impious and all heretics who are not within the church of God, they are all drowned, right? So they're quoting Kyle Lucaris here to disprove one that he wrote that thing and approving the idea that he's saying here. All right. So to me, this is a settled issue in a pan-Orthodox council. We have it implied in Decree 10, and we have it explicit here in the minutes of the council. So we've gone all the way up to 1672 with all the big names, with St. Gregory Palamas, St. Irenaeus, St. Ignatius, um, on and on and go east, west. Everyone's teaching there's no salvation outside the church. Okay. So I've heard Gavin Ortlund, and I think there's others under this mis uh, misconception that there's been some sort of recent reversal. Has there been a post-enlightenment reversal or change in emphasis? Well, I'm going to argue not a reversal, but we've seen a change in emphasis. Why? Let's define terms. Reversal is an annulment of a judgment, right? The Pan-Orthodox Council gave a judgment. Sentence or decree, right? It gave a decree made by a lower court or authority. In other words, an exclusivist doctrine that there's no salvation outside the church would have to be repudiated. Now, I'm going to argue no saint after the Enlightenment, after 1672, let's say, has repudiated no salvation outside the church. So if no one's repudiated it, repudi repudiated it, then clearly that's still the doctrine. We must accept it. It's not like we have two choices. That, that is the doctrine. No one's repudiated it. But is there a clarification of doctrine? Definitely. Why? Because I'm going to argue there's been a change in emphasis because the printing press seems to have increased the pastoral statements published for layman's cons consumption, right? So we're going to see more saints writing back to laymen troubled by the doctrine, right? That wasn't an issue before the printing press because before the printing press, you had to be rich to own books. And so they wrote mostly to other monks or to very people that are very well informed the basic doctrine, no salvation outside the church. But now you're starting to get people, lay people that are actually literate and are reading this stuff and they're starting to get disturbed by it. And so now we start seeing responses to people being disturbed, right? They nuance a doctrine so as to help lay people. They don't repudiate it. So how do they nuance it is very important understanding what's being taught. This is what false teachers in the Orthodox Church and some of them teach in seminaries will misconstrue because they don't look at the context of what is stated. All right. So I'm going to read quotes from Quote Minds. And because a lot of these things are from Quote Minds and I don't own these books, I'm not like a specialist in, in recent Orthodox saints, sadly. I'm not God. I can't know everything. Not all these are context approved. I'm just going to take them at their word. All right. I will specify when I've read a context that I actually have the whole context behind one of these passages. So already the fact that we can't actually look at the context of these passages is highly problematic considering how badly these people misportrayed Irenaeus and Justin Martyr, right? So I'm not going to automatically trust that these passages somehow repudiate these earlier clear passages I just read based on no context. And in fact, when we actually read these things, I think the sort of inferences that those who are against the exclusivist doctrine of the Orthodox Church, the saints teach, um, they can't justify pitting these saints against those saints. So let's start with St. Macarius Optina. He's writing, um, he's speaking to people that are lay people. The quote mine quotes him as follows. As to those people who are good and kind, but are not believers, we cannot and must not judge them. The ways of the Lord are inscrutable. Let us leave these good people entirely to his judgment and to the grace of his providence. He alone knows how and why he has built the argosy of humanity and the small boat of each one of us such as it is. So to me, 
I don't see any repudiation that there's no salvation outside the church. He's giving a pastoral teaching. Don't judge people. We don't judge individuals, right? They're good and kind, but not believers. Don't judge them. So I could judge the doctrine. There's no salvation outside the church, but I don't judge individuals. That's, that is his point. Well, you'll say, well, that's out of context or something. Well, we only have this from a cult mind, so who knows the context? Well, let's see how other saints from the same era spoke. St. Theophan the Recluse also wrote to Lady. He says this, you ask, Mr. Layman, will the heterodox be saved? Why do you worry about them? They have a savior who desires the salvation of every human being. He will take care of them. You and I should not be burdened with such a concern. Study yourself and your own sins, right? Don't judge them, judge yourself, the same point. I will tell you one thing, however, should you be orthodox and possessing the truth in its fullness, betray orthodoxy and enter a different path, you will lose your soul forever. So I think people mishandle this passage and say, oh, he says, if you're orthodox, you can't leave the church, you're damned. But there could be salvation outside the church for everyone else. That's not the point here. So what he says, he says, don't judge other people. Just know for yourself, you won't be saved. It's a pastoral approach to the question. He's not repudiating the historical doctrine of church. He's giving a pastoral approach, okay? So now we have a quote, which is falsely um, ascribed to Metropolitan Philaret of Moscow, who is a saint. This is actually Metropolitan Philaret of Blessed Memory, right? He was a bishop in New York in Rokor. He died in 1985. Well, what does he say? Now you're gonna see here, it does look like he teaches their salvation outside the church. But take note, he is not a saint. And this is 1985, right? The Orthodox Church, uh, we understand correct doctrine to be what once was preached by all, everywhere, and for all time. You can't just come up with this doctrine in 1985 and have it meet the criteria of St. Vincent de Lorenz. That's not how it works. But let's read what Philaret of Blessed Memory says, not Philaret Moscow. I have the citation on the bottom. Here's what he says. It is self-evident, however, that sincere Christians who are Roman Catholics or Lutherans or members of other non-Orthodox confessions cannot be termed renegades or heretics, i.e. those who knowingly pervert the faith. They have been born and raised and are living according to the creed which they have inherited. Just as do the majority of you who are Orthodox in their lives, there has not been a moment of personal conscience renunciation of Orthodoxy. The Lord who will have all men to be saved and who enlightens every man born into the world, undoubtedly, this is the tough part, he says, undoubtedly is leading them also towards salvation in his own way. It's kind of vague to say they are saved, but he says undoubtedly is leading them towards salvation. With reference to the above question, it is particularly instructive to recall the answer once given to an inquirer by the blessed Theophan the recluse. The Blessed One replied more or less thus, you ask, will the heterodox be saved? So he gives one interpretation of Theophan the Recluse, and the interpretation seems to be the one I said is not true. He seems to teach that undoubtedly those outside the church are led to salvation in their own way. Well, who should we trust? Craig Trulia or Metropolitan Filler, Blessed Memory, the incorrupt body in Jordanville, who's, by the way, I've, I've, venerated his gravesite. Um, it would seem like Metropolitan Philaret writing to the um, to the lady, as we see in the pink there. But let's look at someone who I think is more likely to be canonized, new martyr Daniel Sozoyev, because he also interprets Theophon for us. And we got to interpret the saints for the saints. New martyr Daniel says, in question, it's supposedly in questions, page 55, but I've only found this in a quote mine. And you know what? Next time I do a book order, um, I and guys buy books from uh, from Daniel Sazoya Inc. I'm going to buy this book. It says this: We should judge the creeds of the Protestants, Catholics, and members of other religions, but not the people. Right? Exactly what I said. We judge the bodies, but not the people. He says, when Saint Theophan the Recluse was asked, "Will Catholics be saved?" He said. I don't know whether Catholics will be saved, but if I became Catholic, I won't be saved. So he's paraphrasing him. In saying this, he was not being uncaring or saying that people outside the church would not be saved. He was directing our attention elsewhere. We must condemn heresy, but not condemn the person. 
Guys, exactly the teaching that I just gave, right? That's exactly the interpretation I just gave. Missionaries make a huge mistake when they start to treat people with contempt, telling them you are a sinner, you're filth. The Lord did not do that and neither did the apostles, right? We don't condemn individuals. So some people say, well, Craig, I still think Dar uh, new martyr Daniel says, oh, thinks there's salvation outside the church. Absolutely not. He speaks very clear about this elsewhere. Um, I put this in yellow because um, this is in law of God and it's written to those outside the church. It's written for catechumens. He writes this very clearly. Page 26, 27. Only to those who are members of the church of, only to those who are members of the church of salvation promised. All heretics and schismatics are outside her and have no salvation until they repent. Page 26, 27, the context is correct. I just had to reduce it there for you. So very clear passage, salvation's only in the church. Now, this book's only in Russian, page 23, page 24 of lecture course in dogmatic theology, special edition for missionary work. I think it's very clear. Look what he says, right? This is for missionaries to, to try to evangelize people outside the faith. What's he tell them? Right, because we saw in questions page 55, it says missionaries make the mistake of calling people filth and trash and etc. And he says, don't judge those individuals. But what should he tell those individuals about this doctrine? He tells us. New Martyr Daniel says, not a single person is living outside the church adhering to other religious tra traditions can expect to receive that salvation and that Christian's hope. And Christian's saying, that there's no salvation outside the church. This is indirectly confirmed. What happens after death to people who do not, who do not were baptized? They are going to hell. There's no way, no other way for them. So he says there's no salvation inside the church, and he says this is confirmed by the fact that those who are not baptized go to hell. So I don't know how much more clearly um, you want New Martyr Daniel to address this issue, but it's clear he affirms the traditional doctrine of the church. So it's not just Greeks, it's not just Latins, it's not just medieval Roman Catholics, as people claim. Here's, I think, the most recent Russian saint there is, and he teaches the historic doctrine of the Orthodox Church. From St. Paul himself, from St. Clement, St. Ignatius, all the way to New Martyr Daniel Sozoyev, there's a consistency in this doctrine. This doctrine has not changed. All right. So guys, um, just so you know, you can begin asking questions. Um, we will be ending this presentation soon. Um, so please begin asking questions. We got Seraphim Rose, a blessed memory. He writes this to um, a lay person, all right? He writes this to the lady. The quote mine version says the following. It wants us to believe that Seraphim Rose affirms salvation outside the church. He says, these Protestants have a simple and warm Christian faith without much of the sectarian narrowness that characterizes many Protestant groups. So already, they don't have hearts set against the church. They don't have this divorce of charity. So they're a kind of Protestant. Look what he says. They don't believe, like some Protestants, that they are saved and don't need to do anymore. They believe in the idea of spiritual struggle and are training the soul. They force themselves to forgive each other and not to hold grudges. They take in bums and hippies off the streets and have a special farm for rehabilitating them and teaching them a sense of responsibility. In other words, they take Christianity seriously as the most important thing in life. It's not the fullness of Christianity that we Orthodox have, but it's, uh, but it's good as far as it goes. Whether they attain salvation by the practice of Christianity is for God to judge. For some of their views and actions are far from the rule, are far from the true Christianity of Orthodoxy handed down to us from the Christ and the apostles, but at least an awareness of their existence should help us to be aware of what we already have. So those who go against the Orthodox doctrine of no salvation outside the church will use this passage to say that he leaves it open whether they're saved. But he's not doing this at all. He's saying that we should use these people as an example to not be out orthodoxed by the schismatics. Right? That's really what the point of this passage is. And I'm going to now give you the context to show you it's true. Right? Look at the full context. Here's the full quote. Orthodoxy, the true Christianity, is not just another set of beliefs. <coughs> it is a whole way of life. <coughs> Excuse me. That makes us different people and is directly bound up with how much heavenly internal things are present in our life. 
An orthodox person who is not with different can be worse off than the non-orthodox, right? So he's saying, don't be out orthodox. There is nothing sadder than the spectacle of orthodox Christians who possess a true treasure that cannot be valued by any earthly measure, something which may, many are seeking and do not find in today's world. Nothing is sadder than orthodox Christians who do not value and do not use this treasure. Now he says, the section, an, ortho, an example for the Orthodox. That's what he writes. So these Protestants he talks about are examples for Orthodox. These Protestants, this example, have a simple and warm Christian faith without much of the sectarian narrowness that characterizes many Protestant groups. All right, that whole passage I read. An awareness of their existence should help us be aware of what we already have. Some of our Orthodox young people, he continues, for whatever reason, they don't realize that what treasure their Orthodox faith contains are joining such Protestant groups, and some of our uninformed young people go much farther from orthodoxy. One of the 900 victims of Jonestown a year ago was a Greek Orthodox girl, the daughter of an Orthodox priest. A matter of life and death. That's the next passage. So they're all next. These are all in, in order, right? This is all the same context. I'm telling you about these Protestants both as a warning of how Orthodox young people can lose a treasure they already have, they haven't been made aware of it, and more importantly, as a mean of defining a little better the true Christianity which we have and these Protestants don't have. Some of our Orthodox young people are converted to groups like this, but it works the other way around also. Some of these Protestants are being converted into Orthodoxy, and why not? If we have the true Christianity, these there should be something in our midst that someone who sincerely loves the truth will see and want. Orthodoxy in America, chapter 2. So, in short, this is a pastoral point of admonishing the Orthodox not to be out Orthodox. It is similar to St. Augustine, uh, St. Augustine's take on those who are faithful and desire unity, right? He says, I will not judge those people who have, who don't think that they're assured salvation, who live in the matter of Orthodox, who have, no, their hearts aren't set against the Orthodox Church. But I tell you these people because they're more Orthodox than all these other Orthodox people. Right? He says this is a warning. This is pastoral. He's not trying to repudiate the doctrine. This is so clear. I'm going to give you more context to show how clear this is. All right? But I want to bring up, because one of these groups that he talks about, these Protestants that live in such a manner, there was one called the Order of Mans. The Order of Mans followed one of the disciples of Seraphim, of, uh, Seraphim Rose. And guess what? They en masse converted to the Orthodox Church in 1998 to the Bulgarian Patriarchate. I've been to their parish in East Syracuse. There's like 18 throughout the country that are now in the Bulgarian Patriarchate. So the very people, Seraphim Rose said he wouldn't judge, right? He doesn't know the future. He doesn't know if they're going to be saved. Guess what? 18 parishes were brought into salvation. If this does not make him a saint, because I consider that prophetic, I don't know what does. So, um, these people are saved because they're Orthodox. That's what happened to them. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, here's a quote from uh, Seraphim of Rose, a blessed memory. It's quoted in Orthodox Info. Um, it was also quoted by, uh, by a WordPress blog I've seen that um, uh, Brother Augustine just recently quoted its community page. Um, and it says, a catechumen ask about the fate of Christian relatives thinking the Orthodox doctrine is offensive, right? This person, it's pink because this person is a lay person, um, is offended, right? Um, that how dare there be no salvation outside the church? How does Seraphim respond to this person? He says, it is not for us to define the state of those who are outside the Orthodox church, right? We don't judge individuals. If God wishes to grant salvation to some who are Christians in the best way they know, but without ever knowing the Orthodox Church, like, like the order of man's people, that is up to him, not us. We don't judge those people. But when he does this, this is key. It is outside the normal way that he established for salvation. Let me repeat. It is outside the normal way that he's established for salvation. What is normal? There's no salvation outside the church, right? Um, for example, to quote Father Danis Azoyev, he said that they should not expect salvation, right? Because it's not normal. So we should not be assuring people it's normal for Protestants that are good people to be saved. That's not normal. This is what Seraphim Rose says. It's outside the normal way that he's established for salvation. 
which is in the church as part of the body of Christ. A harsh polemical attitude is called for when the non-Orthodox trying to take away our flocks or change our teaching. So as we see, he even gives a reason behind some of those uh, passages we saw quoted where they give very hard lines against the schismatics. Sometimes we are harsh because we want them to repent. But here we see a less harsh quote because we want someone not to be scandalized by the Orthodox teaching. So exactly what I posited when I gave you those colors, we see Sarah from Rose literally differentiating. We talk about this thing a certain way based on the audience. So here we go. Um, you know, People call me a nut. And I'm just saying what the great holy men of orthodoxy say on this issue. So please call me a nut. I'll take it as a credit to myself. Here is a quote from Dimitri Staniloy, the confessor, who's going to be a saint. Probably the, Roma, the Romanian synod will canonize him in a year or so. Dogmatics, Volume 4, uh, Paragraph 67 to 8. You see, uh, uh, Stanley teach salvation, no salvation outside the church. In the present situation of ecclesial incompleteness within the various Christian denominations, the question is raised. Are there members saved? Or in other words, is there salvation outside the church, which is nothing other than one in the full sense of the word? This question cannot be given a simplistic answer. Their incomplete participation in Christ, and this is, to a great extent, not their fault, may consequently result in an incomplete participation in, in him in the life to come. So he does not affirm salvation, but lesser experiences of grace. Now, does incomplete participation in God sound like salvation? It doesn't to me. Um, but let's look at the same book, Volume 5, Paragraph 51. Dimitri Senaloy says, if it is baptism that through the union with Christ does away with the substance of that original sin that separated us from God and was stamped upon our very nature, and if apart from this union with Christ there is no entry into the kingdom of God, then it is clear that baptism is absolutely necessary for our salvation. It is also absolutely necessary for children. For they too, through their birth in the flesh, share in the same state of separation from God. And so they too must pass over from the condition of their bodily birth and their destiny to perdition into the condition of those born of water and the spirit and consequently of the saved. So Dimitri Staniloy teaches without baptism, none are saved. That's, what no that's what's normal. All right. So those outside the church that aren't baptized in the church, how could he be teaching they're saved? That's not what he's saying. He's saying that they have incomplete participations in grace. That's all he is saying. He's not contradicting the Orthodox doctrine. And the people that quote Father Dimitri Steneloy, that they infer their salvation outside the church, that passage, you don't see him quoting this passage where he says, without baptism, um, there's perdition. There's no entry in the kingdom of God. So as we saw, the audience determines what is said. Usually those outside the church are given dire warnings, all right? Father uh, Seraphim Rose says this, and I am telling you this. Usually outside the church are given dire warnings, and the only exception to this is maybe Justin Martyr. He seems to be an exception, but he's appealing that righteous pagans were in fact proto-Christian. So he's like trying to convince the pagans, become Christian, not, not because you should feel fine being pagans, there's salvation outside the church. No, because your best philosophers were really proto-Christians, right? So that's why he's taking the sort of interpretation he gives. But otherwise, it's always categorically dire warnings. Because usually it's the Christian schismatics that these things are written, not to this full-blown pagans. Now, the clergy are very educated, tend to give the full gamut of teachings on the topic. But we also see that Irenaeus supplies the charity standard to determine who's saved. And Augustine and Seraphim Rose concur, right? Like Seraphim Rose said, their hearts aren't set against the church, so I won't judge them. Now, we've also seen, and this is what people don't tell you, what the quote minds don't tell you, um, what they mishandle. Laymen are given nuanced pastoral teachings. Let me repeat. Laymen are given nuanced pastoral teachings they're told don't judge other people worry about your own salvation worry that you're more faithful worry that you're more orthodox don't be bothered by this worry about your own repentance right they're given pastoral teachings because quite frankly most laity shouldn't be getting to um theology like to be honest this channel shouldn't exist sadly there's just so much misinformation 
you know, this shouldn't even exist. We should just show up at church tomorrow, which is a transfiguration for the new calendar. Laymen are given pastoral nuanced teachings so they maintain their faith and their life of repentance. Now, how do we apply the saints' teachings? This saith me and not the saints' Lord. Here's how I think we should approach these teachings of the saints. We ought to directly warn those outside the church. That is the con most consistent approach. And we don't see anyone outside the church not giving dire warnings. right? Those who try to be ecumenical and validate their opposition, we know where salvation is, not where it isn't. But never, even in a nice way, because don't be mean, but in a nice way, warn the hetero heterodox. Um, you know, you should really repent because you you could be damned. You'll likely be damned if you don't repent of this. They contradict the approach of the saints. That's application number one. Number two, in academic and specialized context, nuance is expected. We got to talk about the degrees of grace, the degrees of participation of Christ after the afterlife. I expect that. Like Father Dmitri Steneloy, he was writing to, to people that were educated. He wasn't thinking average schmucks were going to quote mine his work. All right. But let's be honest, especially among the lay people and the very poorly educated teachers we have in the West, not everyone is capable of interpreting this nuance. And I'm going to add to this. This is my opinion. My opinion. Due to entrenched ecumenism, nuance is becoming dangerous as it's preventing number one. Right, we ought to directly warn those outside the church. So I actually take the tact that even in a educated context, I think we we need to stop using these sort of nuances because people are becoming miseducated. We got to make clear the exclusivist doctrine of the church. You shouldn't be graduating from, um, let's say Saint Tikhon's or Saint Vlad's, like uh, Joiner or uh, Shuping graduate from, and not understand this doctrine. That's a crime for them. A moral crime, not to understand this doctrine. Number three, it is appropriate to comfort but not mislead laymen. We ought to give, anyone who's been in the confession would know, you always get nuanced teachings and nuanced applications. But we shouldn't mislead them and think that and make them think that's salvation outside the church because we don't see any of the saints misleading people into this. All right? Saints always avoid explicitly validating the extraordinary means of salvation. I'll repeat, saints always avoid explicitly validating the extraordinary means of salvation, i.e. no saint comes out and explicitly states their salvation outside the church, period. Covered comfort should not be given to the point of actually leading people to believe there is salvation outside the church because there isn't. Filler of blessed memory seems to be outside the consensus of the saints of this question. All right. And as St. Vincent de Lorenz says, we don't, one or two doctors, as he calls them doctors or teachers, they're outside the consensus, don't change what the doctrine of the church is. All right. So he may be outside this consensus, but he's not even a Kenite saint. All right. So I think the fact that they misquote him as St. Philip of Moscow is very telling of how misleading those who oppose the Orthodox doctrine are. Now let's respond to some lame rejoinders. So don't ask me these, I've heard them a million times. But St. Isaac the Syrian, well, St. Isaac the Syrian probably was within communion of the church. Um, Dr. Phil Booth has shown pretty convincingly uh, that the Nestorians at that time, because of uh, Heraclius, were actually in communion. There was a short window of communion with the Orthodox Church. So St. Isaac the Syrian was likely in, actually in the Orthodox Church canonically. Sorry, sorry to bust that bubble for you guys, but it's true. And we actually have a vision of St. Isaac the Syrian from St. Paisos, the Holy Mountain. And St. Isaac the Syrian told St. Paisos, I fought against the Nestorians, and I knew of their heresy. So it literally shows, like St. Augustine said, those who desire unity of the church, right, through every means possible, are saved. So that Isaac the Syrian rejoinder pff, falls flat. Now we see the rejoinder. They are mostly Western saints. One that's wrong because saints are saints. doesn't matter where they're from. That's racist. I thought racism was bad. Um, and two, they're not mostly Western saints. We quote, we quoted St. Gregory Palamas, and Daniel Martyr Sozoya, the, the Council of Jerusalem, 1672, uh, St. Fermilion, St. Ignatius, St. Clement, uh, St. Paul. These are not Western saints. <laughs> All sorts of non-Western saints. So it's wrong. Another lame rejoinder, but grace is everywhere and God does good things amongst other denominations. 
Yes, God's grace is everywhere. There's in, there's incomplete participations in grace. We would all die this moment if God's grace wasn't upholding us. That includes every human being on earth. But that doesn't mean there's salvation outside the church. That includes animals even. Grace is everywhere, but that doesn't mean salvation is everywhere. There is a difference. Another lame rejoinder. Schismatics were more aberrant when these warnings were given. No, they're the opposite. They were far closer to us than the schismatics of today. The Pentecostals, the the Baptists, the Seventh-day Adventists, they have nothing in common with anything remotely close to Orthodox. And they have nothing in common, no, nothing remotely close to the Novations, to the Donatists. And the Novations, the Donatists were told they were damned. So that's not true. Don't repeat lies. Uh, just so you know, uh, the friends of Job are punished by God because they justified God with lies. Um, Job told the friends that God... Uh, God does not to be de need to be defended with lies. So those who use such lies as these, because they don't like the doctrine church, they will have their judgment for this. May God have mercy on them. Mother lame rejoinder. What you covered is not specific enough. Even though I've been talking for an hour and a half, I've shown you the context behind all this stuff and gave you citations to go look into the context yourself. Well, what is most likely? First, I'm going to say there's never enough context. That's, that's just a logical fallacy. It's an appeal to endless specificity. You know, the universalists do this. Not, not, that's, not, uh, that's not specific enough. This is not specific enough. Just be honest. It's pretty obvious what they're saying. And I'm just going to make this appeal to cut around the cake. What is most likely, right? Forget about it's not specific enough. What is most likely what I said? Is it morally safe to ignore this doctrine? Is it morally safe not to teach it? I'm going to say no. Because it's extremely unlikely you can interpret all this stuff and, and arrive at any other conclusion that there's no salvation outside the church. More lame rejoinders. Exceptions exist, so I'm hopeful they are more numerous than the norm. Right? The hopeful heretics. Right? I'm, ho I'm hopeful the heresy is true. Now, sometimes it's appropriate, I will defend these people, to speak hopefully. Let me quote St. Sloan on extolling God's love. He says, St. Sloan writes, There may be some, whether many or few, we do not know, who will meet even this perfect love, this perfect sacrifice, with a rejection, even on the eternal level. So he has this hopefulness that maybe only a few people will eternally be damned. Right? He's saying God's so merciful. Right? He's just trying to, he's speaking like with hyperbole to speak of how merciful God is. And the scriptures do the same way. Like uh, God himself uses this hyperbole. He says, I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments, Exodus 25 and 6. So in the last 10,000 years, there's only been 400 generations. We're now close to thousands of generations. So obviously we use hyperbole, because God himself does, to exaggerate, to make clear, because no word can explain how merciful God is. So St. Sloan is not saying literally there's only few people that are not going to end up being saved. Um, what he's saying is how merciful God is. It's hard to explain how merciful is, and he's lauding God for that. And that's the obvious context behind that. So let's continue. Exceptions exist, so I'm hopeful they are more numerous than the norm. Father Seraphim Rose asserted that, and I'm going to quote this from a quote mine. Since the church does not offer public praise for, the un for dead unbelievers, it is clear that this deliverance of Trajan, for example, from hell was the fruit of the personal prayer of St. Gregory. Although this is a rare case, it gives hope to those who love the ones have died outside the faith, right? So we need like a modified hope, right? We don't judge individuals because there's rare cases. It's not normal. It's rare that someone like Trajan, like tradition teaches, is saved outside the church. And so what's a something, how a way I, I can explain this? It is rare for people to be saved without parachutes. Six people survived jumps from planes, the highest being 22,000 feet, without a parachute. But don't count on it, right? So like if you heard a plane crash in the middle of Pacific and you had a loved one on it and said, oh, this thing, you know, blew up in the sky and blew people outside of it. Well, don't lose all hope your loved one is dead. They're probably dead, but it's okay to have a little bit of hope. But you're not going to take it seriously as in like, absolutely, they're still alive. It's how dare you say he likely died? No, that'd be the opposite of what makes sense. Um, 
And so there's other saints. I think it's St. Christina of Tyre, if I have her name right. Um, you know, St. Christina of Tyre and others that are evangelized by angels. So how can we judge individuals when we have saints that were brought into the church, not through any visual means, but an angel came and brought them the gospel? So we don't judge individuals, all right? We don't know that. But normally, there's no salvation outside the church. So let's answer the question. The answer is, is there no salvation outside the church? Short answer is no. Normatively and canonically, as a matter of rule, salvation can only be expected within the Orthodox Catholic Church. Those outside are damned, though exceptions do exist. Now let me give the long answer. Is there salvation outside the church? No. Normatively and canonically, because the Council of Jerusalem, as a matter of rule, salvation can only be expected within the Orthodox Catholic Church, partaking in its sacramental life, living faithfully. Those outside are damned, though exceptions do exist. Exceptions are not the rule. Nevertheless, there are degrees of grace for faithful, repenting Christians outside the church. And the degree of grace one partakes in this life has a proportionate manifestation in the afterlife. As 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, All appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Charity permits salvation, but the intent to be divorced from the church is a rejection of grace. So that is the long answer to everything we discussed today. Um, so the mystery of salvation, why Trajan, considering he persecuted Christians? Don't underestimate the prayers of saints. There's a lot of mysteries, and we can't get to the bottom of these mysteries. There, he, was in, he had centuries of damnation before going to heaven. So maybe that's the fate of a lot of those outside the church or a lot of faithful Protestants. We don't know. But that's hardly a consolation prize. Clearly, this is uh, centuries of damnation before going to heaven. Some pagans attain to it because Trajan did. So um, it's not really a consolation prize. It still sounds pretty terrible. And there's still no salvation outside the church. But... We don't know for every individual, and we cannot underestimate the prayers of saints. We don't know what happens eternally before the final judgment. We don't know that. Now, let's take into account the fate of the unbaptized. The consensus teaching there's no salvation for the unbaptized. Sorry. Even Pelagius, right? Even Pelagius said there, he, he rejected to affirm their salvation from the unbaptized. That's how extreme affirming salvation from the unbaptized is. Even the liberal academics of the saints, like Father Dimitri Stenelloy, even he affirms there's no salvation from the unbaptized. But the fate of every individual, we don't know. All right? So now the conclusion. The church's full teaching must incorporate no salvation outside the church. Few espouse this without nuance. I'm like the one guy that does. But many reject this teaching outright. Exceptions exist. The basis for these tends to be genuine desire for repentance and faith, but not always, not always, okay? Trajan, right, is an example. So we didn't really show that genuine desire for repentance and faith. We leave it to God to judge ultimately. We don't judge individuals. Due to exceptions ultimately being a mystery, they do not form a rule or standard. What we know forms the rule or standard. The way this doctrine must be discussed should be to encourage repentance, conversion to Orthodoxy, Christianity, and maintaining its members. Okay? So my summary again. We know where salvation is, but not where it isn't is definitionally incorrect. There is no salvation outside the church. We know where damnation isn't, and where it is. Normally, one can only be saved in the Orthodox Church, and outside, they're normally damned. Yet, not everyone in the Orthodox Church is saved, and not every individual outside the church is damned. Exceptions are not the rule. All right, so I will put up, uh, this PowerPoint will be up, and I hope uh, not to have to do this again, because I've seen there might have been audio issues in this. But I'm going to answer some questions, and uh, then we will call it a day. So this is your opportunity to ask questions on this question of no salvation outside the church. Um, Cairo Jorge says, uh, important topic, orthodoxy is the truth. Someone says, the case of Trajan would, prove, would be proof of your statement that not everyone outside is damned. Um, we've discussed that in detail, all right? We have Alan Rule wishing me a happy Friday. Um, I hope that he's a Roman Catholic YouTuber. 
most of this is like Roman Catholic saints until you get to like Gregory Palmas. So we really should be on the same page on this issue. Um, we see, I've always reminded folks that find extreme to say no salvation outside the church. That church is literally referring to the body of Christ. Of course, he doesn't have two bodies. That'd be Nestorian heresy, right? This idea that other bodies are saved, that's Nestorian heresy. We're not Nestorians. Um, Cairo says, people often reduce this teaching to those who don't go through the norm of most Orthodox who all go to hell, but this is not quite it, which is true, right? There's more nuance in the concept of salvation of church and I guess what's normal. And we've discussed that, and that's why it was important to discuss the pastoral approaches that we see on this issue, all right? Um, right, look, I've been called rude. See, I'm rude for just saying the truth and saying the orthodox doctrine. Didn't say anything rude here, um, so don't know what to tell you. Um, if you're saying, referring to the building, of course not, but what does the Bible say the church is? The body of Christ. So yes, you need to be in one body of Christ. So it says, uh, do you need help with PowerPoint slides? I'm not orthodox, but I'm willing to help if it means we don't have to look at gray on teal. Well, you know what? Leave a leave a comment and I'll take you up on that, though. You're not serious. Be careful what you request. <laughs> um, can be the church be said to be a nation without borders? Absolutely not. Because when the saints actually dress schismatics, they put clear that they're outside the borders. When the saints talk about the ark, there's inside and outside. So nation without borders, no. Um, Carl says, this is a major gift of a presentation. There is so much smoke and confusion out there. Flee from the people, obfuscate this, and they're motivated by one force and one force only. It's obviously demonic. That's right. I put my citations up. Scrutinize me. You're going to find everything I said is true. Everything I said is in context, right? So I would hope then that means my conclusion should be trusted more than the people who take things out of context. This schismatic says Palmas was a yoga practitioner and a demonizer. So of course he doesn't look as Gregory Palmas teaches. But I'm, I'm going to put that up there because it shows someone who's not Orthodox saw St. Gregory Palmas' words and was offended by them because he knows what they obviously mean. So if you're Orthodox and you want to affirm St. Gregory Palmas, he's this great uh, saint that everyone loves. you got to affirm no salvation outside the church. All right. Um, we have a defender of St. Uh, uh, of Metropolitan Philaret of uh, New York. So let's see what he says. Miller, Metropolitan Philaret didn't say, uh, didn't say uh, saves them. Be, he says leads them toward salvation. Don't we believe that God leads people outside the church toward salvation? And you know what? It's a good enough um, reinterpretation. I think a pious reinterpretation. Um, maybe I'm wrong. I'm very tired and uh, dizzy right now. But it, yeah, God wants all men to be saved, right? He's leading everyone toward salvation in their own way in that sense. But that doesn't mean they're going to be saved, not unless they repent and become orthodox like the order of man's did. All right, so we're going down the list. Yes, there is no salvation inside the body of Christ, the Orthodox Church. All right, it's not appearing. There we go. Duggan says, and let me take a sip of water. Should also be noted that the pre-Christian philosophers had the advantage of being preached to by Christ and John the Baptist in Hades, which is a good point. That's the one get out of hell free card, the heterodox get. Well, and, but they would have not turned if they had, because will, our people's will doesn't change in the afterlife. So the harrowing of Hades, they were already exposed to the gospel by reading Moses, right? Like Justin Martyr teaches. So keep that in mind. There's no repentance after death. But the, if their will is already inclined towards God, that could have meant something. And if I had a guess, Trajan would have been one of those people, but invisibly, we didn't see it. Um, just like St. Christina of Tyre, right? We didn't see that angel go there, but it does happen. Um, let's see, uh, John Kalarov says, it would be better to examine what the oldest six Naria have about Isaac the Syrian. And um, I'm not aware of any of our saints' lives calling him a schismatic or call him a, a Nestorian bishop or anything like that. So I think the uh, prophecy of St. Pisos, uh, him seeing the saint reveal that to him, um, I consider that legitimate because he's our saint. And the secular historians are showing he was actually right. So, 
Saint uh, Saint Pius says vindicated again. And regards to John Calarafi, a, a great contributor to this channel. I'm so glad I left Romanism for orthodoxy. There is a clarity and obvious grace here, right? The saints give clear teachings on this issue. My life was transformed, and yes, I have hope I never had before. All the reasons to join the church. Um, someone says that St. Varus Canon, I never even heard of that saint. I don't know everything, guys. Is recited for those outside the church. Uh, Quillen quote him. I don't know. I just don't know the passage. I was going to several popular quote mines, by the way, um, on some trad websites and Wikipedia, of course. So, so. don't trust everything that's trad. Um, trust the saints. Trust the saints. Um, let's see. Maybe he's saying that unbaptized martyrs are saved. Yeah, but the unbaptized martyrs desired union with the church. They're baptized by blood, so that doesn't count. <clears throat> um, Harriman says, there is no salvation outside the church, but there is deliverance from Christ outside the boundaries of the church. There's uh, not sure what that means, so you'd have to explain. You would have to explain yourself. Um, we have this. These are people's souls we're talking about. This isn't a coldly logical argument. God has allowed some to be far from orthodoxy. If these people are in danger, orthodox need to evangelize now. Absolutely, we need to evangelize. That's the whole point of these passages. We are in a dying world. We need to evangelize. And you know what? Put your money where your mouth is, goats and roses. All right? Go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. We need to evangelize. Begging for money. I literally... I'm going to have pictures on my community page in a couple days. Literally have the churches of Cambodia cracking. And we don't have money to fix them because the Russians are cut off because of the war in Ukraine. So we need your support. OrthodoxChristianTheology.com slash donate. Every single penny you donate goes to the church in churches in Cambodia. I've had both priests on this show. Please, 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 please. Donate. Put your money where this, this mouth is. This doctrine isn't about being logical and cold. It's to realize this is true. It is to repent. It is to help other people repent. So evangelize. It's going to be a warm day tomorrow. Go out. Give out tracts. Speak to one person about the gospel. Speak to one person about orthodoxy. And not on Facebook. In the real world. Use this as an opportunity to make others repent. One way to give alms. OrthodoxChristianTheology.com slash donate. It's easy. Make a PayPal account, donate $1, $5, $100. And we need consistent givers. Please give to this ministry. We, I will make available to you anything you want scrutinized because it's 100% on the up and up. Please, 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 we need money. We Because uh, the war in Ukraine is getting so long, people aren't as interested in donate, donating anymore. But the issue in Cambodia hasn't stopped, right? We still need donors. So please, please, please. Send money to Orthodox Church, orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. The link is in the info bar. All right. And so someone mentioned St. Virus is the patron saint for the unbaptized. Um, again, the unbaptized, he, he was a martyr. <laughs> so please, like, let, let, that's not a theological argument. Come on. We already know that uh, those baptized by desire are saved. All right. So that is pretty much it. If this has blessed you, like I said, please go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. Um, the link to the PowerPoint for those who want the information is there. And I ask, please pray for me. Um, I uh, will plan on taking next week off. So um, please like, please share this. Please like and share the schism documentary. That's why it's so important because millions of people are damned because they are in schism it's a serious issue there is no salvation outside the church so please like share this video like and share the schism video because a roman catholic can affirm all the stuff i taught here but they need to know their schismatics or how are they going to repent so thank you so much for watching and i'll end this show as i end all of them by quoting jesus rock fight to death for the truth the lord god will fight for you god bless you have a great day